Hi there, church family. It's really good to be with you again this week. Uh, last week I shared with you on the whole thing of joy in every circumstance. And we spoke about how we, we need to celebrate. We need to, to come with joy. We need to understand that the joy of the Lord is our strength. We spoke from Psalm 100, which says, I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart and enter his courts with praise. You know, we can only come to a place of thanksgiving and praise when we're filled with joy. We also know that that um, you know, the Lord says that the joy of the Lord is my strength, that we, we need to understand this, that it's His joy He gives us strength, and that we need to have joy no matter what circumstance we find ourselves in. Well, today I want to go to, to, to another step, and that is to, that we need to learn to stand firm, to stand firm in every storm. No matter what goes on around us, to stand firm. We need the joy of the Lord, but we also need to stand in those low points when we're feeling down and out, that we stand firm. And it's in that place that I begin to, to rejoice. It's when I know who I am in God and what God has done for me and that I stand steadfast, that his joy can fill me and I can worship him with all that I have and all that I am. Because that is in the end what we're called to do. We know that when we get to eternity, we are going to be worshiping. You know, the scripture tells us that you look in Revelations and you'll see them worshipping. The four and twenty elders on their faces, the, the kings casting down their crowns before the Lord and worshipping. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come. And I can just imagine on that day the absolute joy that will fill us as we are surrounded by the loving kindness of our God and our Father. And as we embrace in the warm embrace of our our Saviour Jesus. So today I really want to speak to you about the whole thing of, of standing firm. Standing firm in every storm. Alright, now if we look and we go back and we look at some of the scriptures we looked at last week. In, we looked at, at um, the life of David and we spoke about um, his, his, his battles that he was having against Saul. And uh, how he had fled and he was, he was living in a cave at, that, at a point. And he wrote Psalm 57. And Psalm 57 starts off and he's talking about, you know, Lord, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. And a little bit further down, we get to, to verse 7. And he declares that his heart is steadfast. He declares his heart is steadfast. In verse 8, he then calls himself out. He calls himself to wake up. You know, wake up inside me. Wake up the song of praise. Wake up the, 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 the lute. Wake up. Wake up to praise our good and mighty God. But just before that, like I said in verse 7, he says, My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. And this is something we need to understand. We, we, our hearts need to be steadfast. We need to, to stand firm. We need to know and understand that no matter what goes on around us, the storms that we face, the enemy that rises against us, that we should be firm. We should be steadfast. Now if we go and we look in the Hebrew and we take a look at this word uh, for, that is used, Psalm 57 verse 7. The, the word there, steadfast, is the word nakun. Okay, it's the um, Hebraic word. And, and the word has been translated in a number of different ways, depending on the context and the application of the word in, in um, the Old Testament. Most commonly it is translated as to be steadfast, you know, to stand firm. Other definitions of it is with certainty. That, that things should be done with certainty, which lends itself right along being steadfast, to be certain. There's like a, a relative amount of, it, it's absolute, it's certain. There is nothing that can shake it. Um, it also can mean definitely, definitely, to be steadfast, to be certain, to be definite, um, to stand. To, um, it can also mean to be established. It shall be established. It is firm, steadfast, established. To be prepared, to be ready, to be determined. And this is literally what David is saying. Lord God, I am determined. I am established. I am standing. I am rested in you. I am certain in who you are. I am steadfast. I am steadfast. See, he knew who God was. And he knew who God was in his life. And he stood firm. The root word of, of nakun is actually the word kun. And kun literally means to be firm, to be firm, to be well rooted, rooted on the good ground. You know, much like the, the parable of, of, of the, the good and bad builder, you know, the one builder builds on the sandy land and the other one builds on the rock, you know, the parable that Jesus told. And, and it's the, the man who built on the rock that had a firm foundation, 
that when the storms came, he stood, that building stood. And in the same way, we need to be built on a firm foundation. Our hearts need to be steadfast. Now, within this, this whole thing, it, it's important to understand that, that things will come against us. David understood this. No matter what came against him in life, no matter what happened, you know, whether it was the death threats, whether he was actually physically being hunted, you know, when Saul tried to kill him with the spear while he was worshipping and, and a range of other things that happened to him, many, many negative things happened. David understood I had, that he had to stand firm. He committed sin, he did things wrong, but in the end he always came back and repented and stood on the word of God. And that is what we need to stand firm. You know, but, but in the midst of this, we also need to understand that we have a very real enemy. Yeah, at the time that David wrote Psalm 57, he had a physical enemy in Saul, but there was a spirit behind Saul. You know, we, we see in Scripture that, that, that Saul would, you know, spirit would overcome Saul, and, and David would lead, you know, um, play, play worship, and in that time it would soothe the spirit and, and, and soothe Saul. You know, and, and in the same way, we need to understand that there, there is a physical battle that we face, but there's a spiritual battle, and there's a very real enemy out there, an enemy out there. To get us an enemy that wants to destroy us that wants to stand between us and god okay and we all know his name we all know satan or the devil you know and, and basically satan means the adversary the the one who stands against the one who who comes between and and that's exactly what he does he comes between us you know, and, and and there's a number the scripture shows him in a number of different ways we, we see him in a number of different ways doing different things and coming against the people of god in different ways Sometimes it's subtle. Sometimes it's quiet, deceitful, and around, you know, he, he bends the rules and subtly you know, begins to warm things up and, and to change the way we see things. Sometimes it's an outright attack. Sometimes it's, 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 it's as a roaring lion. And if we look at Scripture, we take a look in Genesis 3. It's, it's probably the first time we actually um, get to see, in, in terms of the Bible, we get to see Satan. Okay, and in Genesis 3, it's when he presents himself in the garden in the form of a serpent. And he comes and he tempts Eve. He comes and he tempts her and he says, surely, surely God won't actually kill you. If he loves you, he, he, he wouldn't suffer death. This won't happen. He, he starts to sow seeds of doubt into her mind. And so she starts to think about those doubts. And as she does, she acts on the doubt. And then we all know what happens since then. So, so he came through deceitful. He came through the back door. He's, he didn't outright say, just eat it. He, he condoms. He, 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 he manipulated her into that circumstance, into that situation where she, she committed the first sin. Uh, if we take a look at Job, we see a different aspect where, where the enemy goes before God and gets God's permission to, to take, have a go at, at Job. And, and I actually want to take a look at this in, in Job 1. Now, Job, scripture tells us, was the wealthiest man in the world. He was blessed. He had everything he needed. Everything. He, he, he lacked for nothing. All right? And so if we look at, at Job 1 verse 6, it says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. So Satan, the adversary, came amongst the sons of God. They came and, and, and he presented himself before God. And then in verse 8 it says, then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? It's, it's amazing when you look at how God saw Job. He saw him as a righteous, upright man, a man who shuns evil. You know, God was obviously the proud of, of who and what Job was. And of Job's love for him. And so he's proudly declaring to, to, to the enemy saying he is, he is an upright man. So Satan answered the Lord and said, does Job fear God for nothing? You know, basically he's questioning saying, Job only, <laughs> Job, Job only fears you. Job only serves you because of what he has. Because he is blessed. He serves you. And he goes on to, to validate that in verse 10. He says, have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased the land. 
So he said, basically, Satan is saying to God, the only reason that this man serves you is because he's blessed. He's got everything he needs. It's easy for him to serve you. He's, not, he's got no rough life. He, he's got everything he needs. Right. But now, stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. So the enemy is saying to God, take away your blessing. <laughs> stretch out your hand. Touch everything he has. Take away your blessing. And, and surely he will then curse you. Because the only reason he's serving you is because you have blessed him. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Now we all know the story as, as we continue from there. You know, as, as the enemy brought different things against against Job. He Job lost everything. He lost all of his wealth. He he lost his sons. His you know, he was covered in sores, his properties burnt. And and you know, his wife even came to him and said to him, you know, why don't you just curse God and die? You know, sitting there on that ash heap of, of his of, of his his former wealth, you know, Job said some profound words. He said, I was naked when I came into this world and naked I will leave. But the one thing is my heart will serve the Lord. You know, his heart, his focus, his everything was still focused on God. He knew that his wealth and the things he had were circumstantial. But there was something more divine that he had in his life and that was his God and his Father. You see, and that's something we need to understand. You see, Job's feet were rested firm in the Lord. I'm sure sitting there amongst those ashes, covered in sores, I'm sure that he was he battled. I'm sure that in the inner man, he, he went through a, a, a battle of, of why this, why me, God? But in the end, he said, you know what? I was naked, and I will leave naked, but my heart is after God. You see, he knew and understand, understood who he was in God. And, and that's pretty much what, what, what the challenge is before us, is to know and understand who we are in God. So, so the enemy brings direct attack. He attacked Job directly. Scripture also says in... In 1 Peter 5, verse 8, it says, The enemy presents himself as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He goes around roaring. He's, he's, he's frightening. He's fearful, looking for something to consume. I don't know if you've ever heard a lion in the wild roaring, but it can be quite a scary thing. And you can hear it for miles, you know, especially at night. I remember I used to take a lot of our, our youth back in South Africa. I used to take them what we call a wilderness camp. And uh, on a wilderness camp, we would go and spend time in various game farms in unfenced camping environments. So there's no fences around us. We would just have our fire. And um, so the wildlife are, are right there. I remember the ones we drove into our campsite. And there, you know, well, against one of the, the, the poles for, for one of the, the little um, LARPA areas, a little um, overhanging area, the, uh, there was a rhino rubbing its horn against the, against the pole that was holding up part of the roof structure. And um, so we chased the rhino off and we set up camp and, and that kind of thing. Um, and I remember the once we were, we were sleeping around the campfire and, and hyenas came into the camp and they, they walked past us, you know, um, while we were sleeping. A friend of mine woke up and saw these hyenas walking past us and was ready to, to smack them, to, to scare them off. You know, but often sitting in those places, you could hear a lion roaring. You know, those roar went on for miles. And it was a frightening thing knowing there's a lion over there somewhere. You know, and, and, and that is what the enemy is like. He roars. He can be heard. He, it echoes. It goes through everything. And it can strike fear. And he's seeking whom he may devour. He is looking for you. He is looking for the downhearted, to, to those that are brokenhearted. Now, that's why in, in 1 Peter 5, 7, just before you know, Peter speaks about Satan as the roaring lion, he says, Cast all your anxieties, cast all your fears, cast all your burdens onto Jesus because he cares for you. It's not yours to carry. And if you don't do that, the enemy is like a roaring lion. He's seeking out those carrying their burdens. He's seeking out those that are not casting their burdens to Jesus. That he may devour, that he may bring deeper fear within our hearts and lives. So he's a roaring lion. In Ephesians 6 you know, in verse 12, Paul also speaks about that. And he, he says that our battle, you know, it says, you know, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against rulers of this dark age. 
So, so we wrestle. The word there, wrestle, is not a war word. It's, it's to wrestle. It's to struggle. It's, it's to contend with. And, and so Paul is saying here, you know, that the things that we battle with, it's, it's not about people. It's not about, about flesh and blood. It's not about the circumstances. It's not about the things around us, but about, about what is behind those things. There's a very real enemy, and he is out to get you. And he does not want you to stand firm. He wants to shake your roots. He wants to shake your foundation. He wants to test whether you are on the, 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 the solid rock or you're built in, in the sandy land. And so we need to know and understand, no matter what our circumstances, no matter what our situation, no matter what goes on around us, we need to know and understand that we are firmly rooted, that we can stand firm in the knowledge of who we are before our God and our Father. Um, David in Psalm 57, you know, he spoke about the whole thing of steadfast. He spoke about his commitment to the Lord. He spoke about how, Lord, I, I'm fixed. And in the same way, we need to know that we're fixed. When our world just seems to be falling apart around us, we need to be able to stand firm under the calling of God. We need to stand firm. In Ephesians 6, Paul actually explains how we should stand firm. In Ephesians 6, it's a scripture we, we all know very well. I've just quoted part of it. Um, but we, we know this, but it, it's an important thing. Um, you know, a lot of people see this as a, a scripture of warfare, but it's not. If you take a look, a predominant word right through this is to stand. To stand. You know, so we need to stand firm. We need to withstand the attack of the enemy. So what does, what does Paul say? Ephesians 6 verse 10. He says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. He's encouraging the people of God, the people in the church of Ephesus, despite the persecution, despite what was going on around them, to be strong in the Lord, to be strong, to remain firm in the Lord. And that's, that's what we need, remain firm. No one understand His power, His power, His might is greater. He's already conquered death and hell. He has the keys. He is strong. He is firm. He is steadfast. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. That you may be able to stand against the wiles. To stand, to withstand. And I like that as well. It says put on the whole armor of God. Not your armor, God's armor. See, it's not about what you can do. It's about what he can do and what he has done. He has conquered the enemy. So here's his armor. Put on his armor that you may stand. That you can stand. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. Therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all taking the shield of faith, which you, with, uh, which you will quench the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always, with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end, with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. So when we look at these different aspects of the armor, it's nothing about what I can do, it's about what God has and will do. You know, gird your waist with truth. Put on the belt of truth. The truth of what? The truth of Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is the truth. He is the truth. And so we need to gird ourselves. The truth is not something that, that, that we can find. It's the truth is who Jesus is. Jesus is the truth. Gird yourself in the truth. You know, the, the, the belt was what kept everything on. It kept the weapons on. It also kept your breastplate in, in, in place. So put on, put on the, the, the belt of truth. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Breastplate of righteousness. Now, what is righteousness? Righteousness literally means to be right with God. Now, that's not something I can actually do. It's what God has done for me. You see, Jesus has become my righteousness. 
I have been made righteous because of Jesus. It's what God did on that cross. It's what Jesus did when he died and rose again. That I can stand in all righteousness. Okay, and that's important. We need to understand that this is a work of God. It's a work of his power. So put on the breastplate of righteousness. What does the breastplate do? It protects all of your vital organs. Okay. Um, and having shod your feet in preparation with the gospel of peace. You know, put the gospel of peace on your feet. The, the gospel of peace. The gospel, the truth, the good news of who and what Jesus is. It's his gospel that will protect our feet. It's his gospel that will prepare us to stand. It's the gospel, the truth of who he is that will prepare us. That if we need to run, we can run. If we need to stand, we can stand. And above all, taking the shield of faith, which you will be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one. The shield of faith. You know, faith. Faith in what? Faith in who and what God is. Faith in who Jesus is or what he did on the cross. Faith that no matter what gets fired at us, I hold that up. When a, a soldier holds up his shield of faith, he knows, he's trusting that that shield will protect him from any fiery arrows that are coming against him. Hold up, take up the shield of faith. And that's exactly what we need to do. Hold up the shield of faith. Trust him. And that is trust we have in God. And once again, faith is also a spiritual gift. It's something we are given. When I'm rooted and stand firm in the Lord, I can stand. Firm in faith, knowing that he is for me, that his purposes are for me, and that he will protect me. All right. And take up the helmet of salvation. You know, helmet of salvation. His salvation is what protects my mind. What Jesus did on the cross, me being set free and redeemed, me being redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, that there is no more sacrifice, that the perfect sacrifice that he made, that is what protects my mind. And so I need to put on that, remembering, Jesus, you save me. <laughs> no matter what comes my way, no matter the negative thoughts, no matter the, the depression, your salvation, your helmet, that protects me. It's you and you alone. Put on the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. You see, what is going to cut down the attacks of the enemy? It's the sword of the Spirit. And that sword of the Spirit, it's the Word of God, is this thing. You know, what did Jesus do when he stood in the, in the garden and the enemy came to tempt him? Every time he took out his own sword and he said, it is written. So Jesus knew because it's written in here, it is firm. It is sure. This is the truth. This is the truth of God. It's the truth of God's word. It's the truth of who Jesus is. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. This is the truth of who God is. And, and so Jesus used his word. And, and he used that word to break down the attack of the enemy. It wasn't, oh, I'm going to bind. I'm going to take authority. I'm going to. No, no. It is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Jesus stood firm on the word of God. And then Paul finishes off there in verse 18. And he says, you know, so what should we do? We should pray with um, pray always with all prayer and supplication. In everything you do, pray with prayer and supplication. Supplication means to, to submit to, to, to hand over, to, to give in to someone else. or, or to you know, So we're submitting to the Father. Bring all things in prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Being watchful in the end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. So we, we need to stand firm. Stand firm, putting on the armor of God. The armor of God is a thing that is going to protect us when the enemy stands against us. He says, not putting on the armor to go and wage war against the enemy. It's putting on the armor that you may stand, that you may stand firm, rooted in the truth of who God is and what he has done for us. And that is pretty much what he is calling us to. He's calling us to, to stand firm. He's calling us to, to submit ourselves to him. You see, when I put on his armor, I'm submitting myself to his authority. I'm submitting myself to his protection. In James 4, he goes a little further and, and he, he's, he also talks about what we need to do. In James 4, from verse 6 to 8, James says, But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. 
So it's when we humble and we know that we need God. It's not about what I can do. It's, it's what He can and has done. When I submit myself to Him, that He gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil and He will flee from you. See, when I'm humble, it's not about me. It's about you, God. I'm submitting all that I am, all that I have to you. I resist the enemy. I stand firm, knowing God. I'm holding up my shield. You can fire your fiery darts at me, but I stand firm. I will not back down. I will not back away. I stand firm against your, your attack. And the enemy will flee. So we need to stand firm. Then if we go and we look at the, the next section in, in, of Scripture in 1 Peter 5, verses 5 to 9, Peter echoes what, what James was saying. In verse 5, Peter says, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. So Peter here was, was quoting the same section of scripture that, that James was quoting. And then he carries on, he says, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all of your cares, your burdens, your anxieties, your fears, casting all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that, at the, that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Okay, so what is James, what is Peter saying here? Peter is saying, you know, that, that we need to submit ourselves. We need to humble ourselves before the Father. Humble who we are before the Father. Resist the enemy in all faith. In all faith. And so that's the encouragement that, that I want to put before you today is to stand firm, humble yourself under his presence. It's not about what you can do, it's what he can do. And stand firm. So just to wrap up, what do we need to do to stand firm? Well, first and foremost, if we look at I've got five, five little points here just to, to make for us. You know, the first point is to be humble. <laughs> I'm humble, it's, it's under God. I'm, I'm, my humility you know, submits me, puts me in that place of, of submission and respect before my Father. I humble myself. Paul, uh, Paul calls us to be humble in, in, and to pray with all supplication, with all submissiveness, to submit ourselves to the Lord. So, so humble yourselves is for point one. Point number two is submit yourself to our God and to our Father. And then point number three, put on the armor of God. It's God's armor. It's what He did. It, it's His salvation that, that He has given us. It's the victory Jesus won on the cross. Put on his armor, resist the enemy, and stand firm. So I want to encourage you just to, in all you do, in all your ways, in, all that you, you, in everything that comes against you, to stand firm. To stand firm. 1 Peter 5, 8, just as a reminder, says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Draw near to him. And when I, when I read that scripture, I'm often reminded of, of the scripture of, of the parable son. Of the little son, sorry, where, where you know, he'd gone and he, he'd taken his inheritance and he'd squandered all of his inheritance. And he was lying in a pigsty and, and suddenly realized, you know what, if I go back to my father, even the servants in my father's house have better than this. So I'm going to go and ask my dad to be his servant, to be the, the lowest of the low in his household. And so he, he went home. He, he drew near. And as he started coming back, his father saw him at a distance. His father was, was watching, and his father saw him coming. And he went running with open arms, and he embraced him. And he took the ring from his finger and put it on him. Yeah, that was a sign of, of all that I have is yours. You are mine, and I am yours. It's, it's giving of his, to his son and loving his son. But not just that, he took the cloak off his shoulders, and he called for the fatted calf to be, to be unkilled and, and, and prepared. He wanted to celebrate that which was once lost has now been found. And in the same way, you know, we need to draw near to God and he will draw near to us and he will celebrate our return and our heart for him. And just to finish off, I want to finish off with 1 Peter 5 verse 10, which says, Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. That's what that prodigal son had. He literally had to humble himself said, Father, <laughs> I don't deserve to be called your son. I don't deserve to be your son, but Lord, I, I submit myself to you. I submit all that I have to you. 
and pray that, 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 that you accept me as, as your servant. And the father said, no, you are my son. He humbled himself. And so 1 Peter 5, 10, he says, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. So when I, when I come before my Lord and I humble myself, he raises me. It's not about me trying to raise myself, me trying to elevate who I am. God will do that when I am submitted and I'm humble before him. So as we wrap up, let's remember that. We need to humble ourselves, submit ourselves to the Lord, put on the armor of God, resist the enemy, and stand firm. Stand firm in every storm. I'd like to pray for us as we, we finish up now, and, and I trust that God's blessing will be upon you as we go forward. So let's just pray. Lord, I want to thank you. You are a good God. I want to thank you for, for the sacrifice you made on the cross of Calvary. I want to thank you, Lord, that, that you are for us. I want to thank you that you have set us apart, that you've called us by name. And so, Lord, I want to pray right now in Jesus' name that your grace be upon us, that your peace be upon us. Lord, I want to pray in Jesus' name that, that you surround us with your love and your grace and your peace and your protection. Lord, I want to pray that, that you help us to stand firm, that when the enemy comes as a roaring lion, when he comes to, to, to seek and destroy, when he comes to devour, Lord, that we will stand firm under the truth of who you are. Lord, I really want to pray that your grace be upon us, your peace be upon us, and that you go with us. Lord, I want to pray that, that you undertake for us. Lord, I want to pray that, that you help us to, to stand firm as we humble ourselves, as we submit ourselves before you, Lord God that you raise us up, that we may stand firm against the attack of the enemy. We pray your grace over us, and we pray your peace over us, in Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord's grace be upon you, may his peace be upon you. Uh, if you have any questions, or, or you want to know more about Jesus, please feel free to, to contact us. We would love to hear from you. We pray God's grace on you, and we pray God's peace on you.